Washington State Representative Jamie Santora. We're here at Drexel Brook in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania at my annual Senior Expo. It's a really good day. We've got hundreds of our seniors that have come out to see all the different programs that we offer here in Delaware County and the surrounding areas. We're very fortunate to have such a great and vibrant senior community and they have been welcomed by our mayor here in Upper Darby, our superintendent of police, and also our senator, Tom McGarrigal. In fact, Senator McGarrigal's here now joining us. Tom, what do you think of the program so far? Oh, this is a great event. You have so many, so many participants here, so many tables bringing seniors great information that can help them with all types of services. You did a great job. This, this event is, is twice as big as last year. Keep up the great work. Well, I appreciate you being here. I know how important it is to you as it is to me to make sure that our uh, seniors are taken care of. And one of the big things that you know and I know is that the SEPTA key um, photo IDs have been a really big hit and we've been offering them in our um, office. What do you think about that? It's a great idea. It helps the seniors out there. Uh, I think in October they'll be, they'll be rolling the program out to, for a free ride for the senior citizens. So it's a, we, you, either Jamie's office or my office, just stop by at any time, get your photo taken, and anything we can do to help the senior citizens of Delaware County, uh, Jamie and myself, we're here to do it. Thank you. Well, Senator, I know you have the overall 26th Senatorial District, but I know you concentrate a lot in the 163rd, and we do appreciate that. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. So again, the program's gonna go on all morning here at the Drexel Brook. Um, we have over 80 vendors representing um, all of the different programs in Delaware County. Everything from our district attorney's office to our police department and um, every single program you can think of from in-house healthcare uh, to different uh, law firms that help with um, wills and estates and we're just trying to really focus on our senior community here at Drexel Brook today. And we continue to serve them each and every day in our constituent offices. Uh, my one office is located at 5248 Township Line Road in Drexel Hill. That serves a lot of the Drexel Hill and Havertown community. And then you've got our uh, Clifton Heights office at 6 South Springfield Road. And that serves the Alden, Clifton Heights, Westbrook Park, and Seacane communities every day from Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30. And we look forward to seeing you there whenever you need anything from our office. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out. Uh, the number will be on the screen momentarily so that you can see our phone numbers, our email address, our website, and the addresses to our offices. I'm now joined by Jack Whalen, who's the District Attorney of Delaware County. He's another one that really works hard on behalf of our senior population here in Delaware County. Jack's got many programs. Uh, one of the ones that I'm most proud of that Jack is really spearheaded is the drug take back program. People don't realize that they can dispose their drugs all over the county here in Delaware, in Upper Darby, Havertown, at our police departments, as well as Alden and Clifton Heights. Uh, this is a program that I know you're proud of. And why do we have this program, Jack? Well, the program is very important because trying to take uh, dangerous drugs out of the households, keeping dangerous drugs out of the hands of individuals that may become addicted to it. As we know here in Pennsylvania, there's been a scourge of opioid abuse, there's been a scourge of addiction, and most of it's tied into the serious addiction to opioid and heroin abuse. It's important to get opioids out of the house because they lead to addiction, and if we can take them out of the house, if we can encourage our household members, our senior citizens that may be relying on some of these drugs after surgery or as a result of some type of uh, medication prescribed by the doctor, the unused portion, let's get rid of them. Every single police st uh, station in Delaware County has a drop box. If we get them out of the hands of, uh, of the residents that don't need them anymore, we'll keep them out of the hands of our children. That is great, Jack, and thank you for doing and spearheading that program. I know another issue is a lot of seniors are preyed upon by uh, con people, I'll call them, and they call their homes, they find ways to actually, they put your phone number from the district attorney's office in the caller ID, so they think it's a legitimate call saying that the IRS is coming to arrest them and everything else. What is the, I know that you have some ideas on what should happen when people get those calls. Let, could you share that with us? Sure, absolutely, and we're seeing more and more of these type of calls. First of all, we're asking if you have caller ID, rely on it. Most of these 
uh, IDs will come up as an unknown number. If you're not familiar with the number, uh, don't answer it. Uh, if you don't have caller ID, then we're asking you if someone is asking you for money, and I don't care who the person is, except maybe your relative, but if it's somebody you don't know asking you for money, we're asking you to hang up on that individual, do not engage in that individual in conversation because they are running a scam. And if they're trying to tell you that you've won something, if they're trying to make it sound that they're going to give you money, if it sounds too good to be true, it always is, and don't engage that person also. You could certainly tell that person to send it to you in writing, mail it to your house, but usually you fall into a, a scenario where you become victimized when you agree to send money in order to get money. It never works that way. So you, you heard it here from our district attorney, just hang up on the people. Um, and Jack, if somebody from your office were going to engage with someone because of an issue, I would assume that it's either going to be in writing or in person. And do they, do your officers and your CID carry identification or badges or anything of that sort? Oh, sure. Any reputable uh, organization, whether it's PICO at your house, whether it's uh, a, a, a township representative or in our case, our criminal investigation division, we all have badges. We all have identification cards and always ask for that. And if you see somebody in the neighborhood that doesn't belong there, please either call the Upper Darby Police Department or your neighborhood police department, or call the township building and report them. If they're going door to door, they're supposed to have a permit, they're supposed to be registered with the township, uh, make sure they are. Great, Jack, thanks for joining us today and thanks for all the good work you do. I'm now joined by Community Affairs Officer Tom Nee of the Upper Darby Police Department. Tom's here as one of our vendors. He also is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to being safe in the community for our seniors, our fa younger families, and our young professionals as well. So Tom, what is one of the things that you hear most from seniors in your job? I think a big problem nowadays is actually the identity theft, uh, the scams that are uh, out there. These people do try and scam our seniors. I think it's important that they get educated and report to us, the police department, so we can investigate and make sure nobody else becomes a victim. So that's been a common thing today at our senior um, expo, is if you see something that's not right, report it. And I think that's probably the best message we can possibly send to our seniors. Unfortunately, we live in a world where not everybody is on the up and up. And we, we do have a lot of good people in our community, uh, the majority, a big majority, but those few that aren't, are preying on our seniors, are preying on different families and things like that. What are the, some of the things that you advise people when they are going away or when the phone rings and it's somebody that seems that it could be a scam? Yeah, I think it's very important that they be aware of what's going on. If it doesn't sound right, it probably isn't. It's very important that they report it to us, to 911, so we can uh, prevent anybody else from becoming a victim. It seems like uh, when our seniors are victims of these crimes, uh, the people who do this, who are responsible for this, uh, are the actors that come from who knows where, and they're, one reason they come here is a scam, are seniors. So you have no issue with telling someone to pick up the phone and dial 911, is that correct? Absolutely not. Please call 911. Uh, we have to know because you may prevent somebody else from becoming a victim. Great. Thank you for being with us today, Tom. I'm here now with Mr. Sant Patel of Clifton Heights. Mr. Patel's lived in Clifton Heights for over 40 years. And I wanted to ask you, what is your number one concern of being a resident of um, the Delaware County? I would suggest that I've been in 40 years in Clifton Heights and the school taxes are going up and up. And right now, Clifton Heights paying more taxes than in Newtown Square. So if you can do something about it, and I know I got the letter, you are working on it, and I, we are really appreciate that. Clifton Heights is the best place to live right now. Everything is there. That's great, Mr. Tell. You know what? That is a big concern of so many people are the school taxes. And that's why we're going to continue to fight to push through bills like House Bill 504 that would reduce your taxes by almost 47% on your school taxes. That can help a lot. That puts money right back in your pocket. As people know, in Pennsylvania, we, are not, we do not tax seniors' income for retirement income. So that is a direct effect in your pocket so that you can go out and be able to afford to stay in your homes, be able to spend more in our communities. And that's what keeps our businesses going and keeps our businesses growing. 
Thank you for joining me here today. I'm here with Paul Drabinski from Brunswick Avenue, and he's going to share with us about the time that he moved into his house and where he is now. When I moved into my house almost 28 years ago, at closing, my taxes were $770. Now they are $5,300. And I think I get less now than I did before. So one of the things we're working on, which I think could help you, is property tax reform up in Harrisburg. And what that would do for you is it's, it would be a step towards elimination. House Bill 504 that we passed this year would reduce your school taxes by about 43 to 47 percent. School, school taxes are outrageous, and none of my boys went to Upper Darby School. They went to Bonner Prendy, and I still. And, and it's not just for me; it's for these seniors in their 80s who are living on bread and butter to pay your taxes, and they can't afford an apartment for a thousand dollars a month. So one of the big things that we're going to continue to focus on and fight for is that reduction in property taxes. 20 percent would be great. One went to Chestnut Hill College and one's going to Thaddeus Stevens School of Technology. And it's going to take them 20 years to pull their, pull their loans off. And I'm trying to help them, but I only get 900 some dollars a month Social Security and they're taxing me. And one of the things that Pennsylvania does is we do not tax Social Security. We do not tax any retirement income, which is a good thing. But you're starting to hear a common theme here, which is the property taxes. And it's something that we really need to focus on. We did it this session. We've got to continue that fight and make sure that it gets through and put onto the governor's desk because it'll help everybody here in Delaware County. It'll make a significant impact on our senior community, our working families, and new young folks starting out that are trying to buy a home. Thank you for joining me today. I'm now joined by Bonnie Gallagher, the Program Services Advocate for Human Services here in Delaware County. Bonnie, I know you do a great job for our seniors. What's one of the biggest things that you see coming through your office? Uh, we see the need for our people needing benefits, medical assistance, SNAP benefits, long-term care for elderly, waiver services, uh, LIHEAP, which is going to be starting in a couple months. So these are things that they come into my office and my incredible team. I got to tell you, I'm just so proud of that team. They do such a great job. But a lot of these things are referred to you so that you can uh, help advocate for these seniors, correct? Correct, right. And I should say, you do have a wonderful staff, I must say. Uh, been working with them for many, many years. And they're great with their constituents that do come in and need help. That's great. So the message and the reason I asked Bonnie to join me was the message that we want to send to you is come into my office, get the programs and the services that are there for you as seniors that live in our area. We are here to serve the community and we have people like Bonnie that is an expert at all these different types of programs. We want to make sure that you're getting access to all of these programs and services that you're entitled to. You've worked hard your entire life. You should be utilizing the programs that the state and the federal government have to offer. And that's why we have advocates here like Bonnie that are here to serve you. Uh, Bonnie, any closing statement that you want to say for the seniors? Uh, as, he, as the uh, state rep is saying, any help that you may need that you're not getting at the local level at the county assistance office, feel free to go into his office for the help because they are there, his staff is there to help. And the county assistance office is also there to help in any way, if not for themselves, for any friends, neighbors, etc. They're there to help you. Thanks, Bonnie. Keep doing what you do because you do a great job at it. I've asked Linda Petropola to join us. She is my office manager in both the Clifton Heights and Drexel Hill offices. Linda, what's the number one thing you see from seniors when they come into the office? Most of the things that we see from the seniors is help with their rent rebates. That's the most popular thing. So tell the audience a little bit about the rent rebate program. Well, the rent rebate program is offered to uh, 60 seniors 65 or older, widows 60 and over, um, and it depends on your um, income that's coming into your house. Great. So, Linda, anybody can call anytime and get information on that rent rebate program from either of our offices. That's correct. And this program ends December 31st. 
All right, so that's an important message. You want to get that in before December 31st. Linda, give us a little uh, background, what our office hours are and things of that nature. Our office hours are 9 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, and most of the time there's someone there even during our lunch hours. Great. And Linda, thank you for doing what you do for the constituents of the 163rd. We really appreciate it. A representative is only good as good as the team that he has behind him, and I'm very fortunate to have a very good team working on your behalf each and every day. I'm available by appointment anytime. And again, I'd like to thank all the seniors that came out to our expo today. Um, it really means a lot that you had interest in coming out and learning what was available for you. We offer these programs every year. We have a veterans program that we do with our veterans breakfast to thank our vets. We do a family expo on an, every other year. And we try to get things that are brought in our area, brought to one place so that you can see what's available. Please um, come into the office anytime you need our assistance. And thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'm Jamie Santora, the state representative for the 163rd. Did you know that in the corridors in the first floor of the capital of Pennsylvania, there are nearly 400 individual mosaics? The idea for creating these intricate tiles was first suggested by Henry C. Mercer in 1902. A year later, he received the commission to prove 16,000 square feet of pavement tiles for the great rotunda and corridors of the new state capitol building in Harrisburg. Mercer set about designing subjects for approximately 400 mosaics. He chose as his general theme the history of Pennsylvania, and he soon realized that his tiles could tell stories. Although the arrangement seems random, the mosaics are very thoughtfully placed in the floor. The tile sequence is roughly chronological, beginning at one end with the scenes depicting the Native Americans. The mosaics progress into the story of European habitation in the New World and encompass the Commonwealth's triumph through process and intervention. Now you know. Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm Anthony Tezak. Joining me today is your state representative, Jamie Santora, to talk about an issue that has been discussed amongst Pennsylvanians for decades, property tax. Representative, welcome. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for having me today. When you're out in the district and you're talking to your constituents and you, know, you ask them, you know, what's the most important issue that you want me to tackle as a representative, where does property tax fall? Number one. Yeah, it's you have one and one a we have property taxes and education funding as you know they go hand in hand um, however property taxes is a broader discussion because it affects everybody that owns a home in the township or uh, municipality that I represent there's been a lot of effort in the past years to try and tackle this problem however we've never been able to get a bill signed by the governor uh, What's the biggest hurdles you face when looking at these proposals? Well, Anthony, you have to take a look at the makeup of Pennsylvania. We've got many different types of areas. You've got a major city in the southeast in Philadelphia and its surrounding counties. Then you have a lot of farmlands and um, other areas that are, make up Pennsylvania. There's some areas that just don't have a property tax issue. We down in the southeast have a major property tax issue and we've got to keep people in their homes and this is affecting it. So we've got to do a thing called compromise and that's what we did this last year with House Bill 504. We found a, a compromise that worked um, for both parties, for people in all different regions of the Commonwealth and we were able to bring a bill out of the House and over to the Senate. Now it's still sitting there. However, it's progress. We've got to do that same compromise again next term and really get this thing uh, filtered out and onto the governor's desk. Uh, there's been a plan that's been discussed widely uh, over the past years, and that would eliminate the property tax, uh, but replace it with a higher income tax and also an expansion of the uh, sales tax onto some items that have never been taxed before. Is this a plan that's still being considered by the House? They're looking at it, but they're looking at different options. You're referring to House Bill 76 um, and Senate Bill 76. 
my answer right now is I don't know if that bill can get across the table. I think a variation of that bill can get across the table, but it's a matter of is it personal income tax? Is it sales tax? Is there different revenue sources that can play into it to make it successful? What are some of the other proposals and ideas that uh, you, uh, the caucus has been uh, discussing? So just yesterday we had a meeting with the leader to talk about just that. What, what are the proposals that we can work on together to make it work. So some of the ideas is another variation of House Bill 504, which is a step towards elimination. Um, in our district, for example, it would bring down property taxes in William Penn School District by over 50%, in Upper Darby School District by close to uh, 47%, and in Haverford School District, 39%. Those are significant reductions. If we can get a bill that is similar to 504, doesn't hurt the pocketbook that much in personal income tax, stays away from the sales tax, I think we've got something that could be successful. What are the chances of a uh, property tax uh, bill making it to the governor's desk in that session? Well, that's what some of the good news. We've Again, we spoke to the leader yesterday. There was a small group of us together that are big advocates of this. And he's been in contact with the governor about it. And how do we get the governor on board to come out and um, advocate for it as well. So that to me is the key. If we can get you know, the House, the Senate, and the governor all advocating for a bill, we will get there and we will get it done next session. I don't want to wait two years in the next session. We need to get it done sooner because we've got a real problem. And we, again, I, I keep coming back to seniors should be able to stay in their homes. Working families should stay in their homes. And young professionals should be able to afford to live in the neighborhoods they grew up in. You mentioned earlier in the program that when you talk about property taxes, you automatically have to talk about education because they go hand in hand. Is there any concern that property tax reform or elimination could hurt funding for local school districts? As I said earlier, it does go hand in hand. And one of the things that we've been working on up here in Harrisburg is to increase the education funding. Now, increasing that education funding stabilizes property taxes potentially, but it doesn't eliminate them. And that is something we need to work on. Now, from the standpoint of your question on does it, can it hurt the school districts? Not if we appropriately fund school districts like we have been doing over the past several years. We have a basic education funding formula in place to make sure that school districts that were not getting the funding they needed are getting additional funding first. Um, so that went into effect this past year, and that's, that's a great step in the right direction. There's more that we have to do to assure that school districts will not get hurt as we take more of the burden at the state level and take it off the property tax owners. Can you tell us a little bit more about the education funding formula, how it came together, and uh, in your opinion, if it was a successful uh, approach? It, it was a successful approach. So the way, the way it came together was there was a, fun, a commission that was put together, and it was a bipartisan commission uh, made up of both House and Senate and other leaders. And what they, what they did was they went out and really did the homework. They looked at what needed to be done. And then they also looked at the other effect of it. If we were to, we've got to implement this thing, but over time. So we started with any new money would be run through this basic ed funding formula. Over time, I would like to see that turn into all money runs through the basic ed funding formula. But you can't hurt the districts that had been getting appropriate funding and reduce them down in order to help others at the same time. We've got to make sure that everybody's getting the funding that they need. There was a plan that was talked about, and I believe it was a uh, proposal that was put forth by uh, Governor Wolf. Uh, however, when, look at, when you looked at the plan, although property tax may have been either reduced or eliminated in some areas on a state level, there was no protection in there to ensure that the local school districts couldn't recreate the property tax. Yeah. When you're looking at these proposals, uh, are you, uh, do you have that in the back of your mind to ensure that local districts can't uh, you know, more or less there go has rogue. to be a fair bounce and that's how I look at it and there there's ways to do it if a if we are providing the funding adequate that is needed to do everything that we're mandating that's one thing it's when we're not providing that school districts have to have that backup plan and we've got to give them that opportunity 
but to go put you know in um, turf fields and put in the latest technology, which is great. It's a great educational tool, and I'd love to see every district have it. But that has to be decided upon by the taxpayers. Um, it can't be done on a whim. So those are the types of things we have to look at and make sure that the school districts are using it wisely. I, I'm very comfortable with the school districts in the 163rd because they do use their funds wisely. They, they, they are out using it for learning supports. They're out making sure that they've got the best uh, educational tools for the schools. You come into some of our schools, um, they're, some, they're very old schools and they need updating. They're at that point in time, so they do need that funding. Uh, this year they approved doing um, new wiring for the computer systems. It's, it's a necessary thing, and it probably should have been done a long time ago, but they're gonna use today's technology. Uh, we have mandates out there. We pushed the Keystone exams back two years. That's not enough, in my opinion, I'm, I'm all about eliminating the Keystone exams, but if they are going to come back, they've gotta have the technology because if there are kids that are not successful in them, there's a program that they can do, but it's all internet based. So if they don't have the technology to go with it, th again, they're going to not be successful and that's not right. They've gotta be armed with the tools in order to educate today's student. You had mentioned that uh, one of the problems when tackling property tax is the diversity of the state and uh, it, you can really get a good look at that picture when you look at the bank accounts of some of these school districts. You have some school districts that have tens of thousands in the reserves, while not far away you have school districts that are just scraping by and trying to borrow money to meet bills. Is it right for some for these districts to be, uh, when it comes to funds available, for that large of a gap? So I think what you meant to say, some school districts have tens of millions of dollars because that's the reality. Um, take a school district, so I've got Haverford School District, I've got Upper Darby School District side by side. Haverford is a smaller school district. They keep X amount of dollars in the reserve fund um, for a rainy day, emergency. Upper Darby does the same thing. Upper Darby School District's a much larger school district, so they need to have, you know, I believe they have about $17 million after this year they'll have in that account. They need it. They lose a system in their high school, they could eat away at two to five million dollars of it. A roof on their high school could be, you know, a multi-million dollar project or any one of their schools. Again, large school district, you need to have that appropriate funds. Also, if you want to have borrowing power, you know, be able to put bonds out there once in a while, you've got to have a certain amount of money in your reserve amounts or you're not going to get that funding, which then will increase your taxes because your borrowing rates will go up. So there's a lot of formulas that go into it. But the ones that have, you know, $50 million in it and 2,800 kids in the entire school district, there, there's an issue there. And then they're still getting 80% of their funding from the Commonwealth. That needs to be looked at. And we only have about a minute left, but any final words on the property tax issue and the necessity to change the way we fund our schools? Yeah, we, we've got to move it over. We've got to make it a state level funding program. We've got to adequately fund all of our school districts across the Commonwealth. Um, it's my number one goal. It, it, besides education funding as a whole, property tax reform, it is impacting my area. I am not gonna give up on it until we are successful and I'm really hoping this next term brings us to that success. Um, we really need to look at it this next session hard. We've got to do it early and get it on the governor's desk and signed in the law. All right, Representative Santora, thanks for spending some time with us and good luck uh, as you move forward and tackle this issue. Great, thank you Anthony. That's all the time we have for today's program. If you have questions or concerns about what you have just saw or any other state government related matter, Representative Santora's contact information will be on the screen in just a moment. Thanks for watching and please join us again next time for another edition of Legislative Report.